you have your Bible, I want you to open to John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. I'm excited about this word today because we started talking about something last week. And I kind of feel like I wanted to take this week and even possibly next week and just go a little bit deeper into the idea of what it means to be blessed and living under the blessing. Remember, the blessing is not an event. The blessing is a lifestyle. When something good happens to me, that's not a sign I'm blessed. I believe good things are going to happen to me because I'm blessed. But even if something bad happens, God's going to make it work out for my good because I'm blessed. So even the bad things are working in my favor. Even the turnarounds are working in my favor because I'm blessed. And so we're going to take this idea just a little bit further in digging into the blessing. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus is speaking here and he says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come. You can see him kind of pointing to himself. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. God, prepare someone's heart to receive your word today is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly i started thinking about that because you know here at city gate we have our logo and we have them three dots and those three dots represent there's more coming and people ask me a lot they say what does more mean well turn to john chapter 10 verse 10 and you'll find out what the more is all about not just life but more abundant life not just, and who's Jesus talking to? Can we clear this up real quick? Is Jesus standing in a cemetery talking to a bunch of people in their graves? Or is he talking to people who are alive but not experiencing abundant life? I believe he was talking to people who were alive but not living the fullness of the life that God had provided or wanted to provide for them. Not just that they may live. Not just that they may have life, but they may have life more abundantly. In other words, you could be alive but not living. And that's what he's showing us here. There are people walking around today. There are people listening to me today, watching me today, who are alive but not living. So what does it mean? They're not living the life he wanted them to have. He uses the word abundant. The word abundant, the definition is more and better life. Life like God wants you to have it. Over and above. More than enough to have a positive advantage. So when he says abundant life, he wants you not just to have life, but over and above life. Overflowing life. He wants you to walk into every situation knowing you've got the positive advantage. I know other people are applying for this job, but because I know Jesus and Jesus knows me, I got a positive advantage. When my resume hits the table, there's something different on my life. You say, what does it mean to have the abundant life? It means I'm blessed. Somebody shout blessed. 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 It means to cause your life. The word blessed means to cause your life flow like a river. I may get into that next week. To flow like a river. And everywhere that river goes, life springs up. That's the blessed life. See, when you're living the blessed life, everywhere you go should be blessed because you're there. You can't find a river that there's not life growing around it. That's what rivers do. They bring life. See, when you go into the company, they should see, hey, when we get them on our team, our whole company is going to be blessed. Our family's blessed because you're in it. A church is blessed because you're in it. Flow like a river. But here's the, here's the definition I really want to zero in on today just for a few minutes. Blessed. To cause your life to go forward. 
to cause your life to go forward. I've entitled this message today, Grit Don't Quit. Can you say that with me? Grit Don't Quit. Grit Don't Quit. So God's saying, I want you to live the, bun- the abundant life. I want you to live the blessed life. In other words, I'm going to put something on your life that will cause you to move forward. Now, if God is bringing something on my life that is going to cause me to move forward, then there must be an opposing force that is trying to get me to stop or even go backwards. If I'm not able to move forward without the blessing of God, then it stands to reason that something is there trying to stop me. Something is there trying to stop my progress. Something is there trying to stop any movement of my life in the direction that God wants me to go. He wants me to stop. In fact, he may even try to push me back to places I've already been. So if I'm moving forward, how do I measure my power of going forward. So the measure of going forward, the measure of forward movement is called momentum. So how do you measure momentum? Listen to this definition. Momentum is measured by the force it takes to stop something. So if I want to determine the momentum of a car going down the highway, I just have to figure out what what will it take to stop that car? If I want to measure the momentum of a train barreling down the tracks, then i got to figure out what will it take to stop that train in its tracks. Then I can determine the momentum that train had. It's the measure, the force, measuring the force it takes to stop something. So here's the big idea. What would it take to stop the momentum in your life? Has the enemy measured out your momentum? Has the enemy figured out what it's going to take to stop your dream? Has he figured out what it's going to take to stop your faith? What it's going to take to stop your family? What it's going to take to stop your marriage? What it's going to take to stop your dreams? What it's going to take to stop... Has the enemy already figured that out on you because he has measured what it took to stop you? Your opposition... Here's the big idea. Your opposition has come because of your momentum. If you didn't have momentum, opposition would have never showed up. Opposition has showed up in your life because the enemy recognized that person's moving forward. That individual has a destiny. That individual has a purpose. That individual has something on their life. And you can see God's trying to advance them, move them forward. They're about to open a business. And and that business is going to bless the church one day. So I've got to stop it. I can see that that marriage, God's going to use that marriage. So I've got to stop it. I can see that there's something on their kids. So I've got to bring something into their life to stop their kids. And the enemy has come into your life with opposition because he saw a momentum on your life that can only come from God. Remember, whenever you threaten the devil, he will bring the opposition into your life and try to find your momentum, the thing it will take to stop you. And here's the thing. Everybody's momentum is different. What stops you won't stop me. What stops somebody else won't stop me. So the enemy schemes. He's crafty. He watches. He's patient. And he brings things into your life saying, oh, did that bother them? What did it do when I brought this into their life? What happened when I introduced this into their life? Okay, so I I caused them to lose their job, but they kept going forward. So what I'll do is I'll bring sickness and see how that affects them. Well, sickness didn't stop them. They kept going forward. So I'll I'll package something else because I'm just trying to determine what's it going to take to stop that individual. Because if I can stop them, I can stop the dream. If I can stop them, I can stop the purpose. If I can stop them, I can stop the miracle. Now, all of us have had those things show up in our life that made us just want to quit. Come on, let's be real today. You've... We've all had things that made us want to throw in the towel, stop, and give up. But let me tell you something real quick. Here is a, this is something to remember. Wanting to quit 
is a sign of success. Only successful people have something to quit. If you ain't got nothing to quit, you ain't done anything. Successful people are the only people who can quit because they have something to quit. So the fact that you want to quit means that you're already successful. Here's another idea. You are successful because you have something to quit. We know God's will for us is to have an abundantly blessed life. But in reality, we all face this opposition that the enemy brings into our life to make us. And the enemy, he will make you want to quit because you're not where you want to be. But the fact you want to quit means you're not where you were. And so he starts bringing opposition. He starts bringing opposition into our lives. And I want you to, if you're taking notes today, you're going to want to write some of this opposition down. Because the goal of the enemy is to, to build up walls. If for no other reason than to box you in. So here's the first wall the enemy brings into our life. Now, if you've had any church experience, maybe you have no church in your background, so this wall may not apply to you. But for those of us who have some form of church in our background, we have all had to face the wall of religion. Religion, and, and I know what you're thinking, is religion really bad? Well, th- th- I'm saying there's, there's good parts of it, but what I'm talking about is man-made religion. It is religion that has nothing to do with the Bible. It is religion that man brings in because man's ultimate goal is to control you. So they control you by getting you to be afraid. Afraid of everything. I remember when I was a little kid growing up, you didn't want to be saved because of the goodness of God. You wanted to be saved because God was so bad. You better not mess around before you get married. The rapture will come. Jesus leave you here, and you're going through the tribulation. Big old scorpion's coming out. Going to sting you. It's going to last for six months and all this kind of stuff. All because my hormones? Yep, that's right. You gave in to your hormones because you serve this big old mean, angry, vengeful God who's just looking for a reason to throw a lightning bolt from heaven and smack you on top of your head and give you sickness or give you cancer or cause you to lose your job or cause you to go broke because that's the kind of God you serve. He's just this big, mean, angry God that's always mad at you. No one ever told me about a God that was mad about me. He was so busy being mad at me, he never had time to be mad about me. Religion shows you a God who's mad at you, not about you. So religion tells me that I got to get right to get saved. But relationship says get saved if you ever want to get right. This is a wall. How about this wall? I know nobody wants to talk about this wall this morning. Many of you have had to fight through this wall right here. It's the wall of family. Now, you've been blessed with good family. I've been blessed with good family. Family, for the most part, is good. But if you're not careful, family will start trying to bring walls into your life, and they will build walls into your life. They will put you in a box they don't want to live in themselves. And they don't ask your opinion. They don't ask your permission. They just go ahead and build this box and they demand you live in this box and then get mad when you refuse to live in this box. So family shows up and family says, we've already got your career path chosen for you. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. Well, who do you think you are? Everybody in our family has done this and you're going to be the one who doesn't want to follow this career path. And so they've already built the box for you and now they're demanding that you live inside of it. Family will tell you, I better not hit on this. It's Mother's Day. If you've ever had kids, then all your families had an opinion on how to raise those kids. 
You shouldn't take care of them like that. You shouldn't feed them like that. You shouldn't uh, wrap them up like that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, Blake's got a new baby. You shouldn't do that with your baby, Blake. I go over and I see things Blake's doing wrong. I know he's doing it wrong, but I don't say anything. It's his baby. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and family will get mad at you because you're not raising your child the way they want you to raise your child. Family will get mad at you if you don't go to the right church. They're not satisfied that you're just in church. They'll get mad because you don't go to the right church. The whole, our whole family's life, we went, up, we went to church and there was this demographic in the church. And now you're going to break out and go to a church that doesn't have the demographic that the, of the church you were raised in. Who do you think you are? Our church, I'm thankful that God has blessed us here at City Gate Church that we're predominantly African American in this church. I think that's awesome. I think every Sunday that we're in this building, every Sunday, City Gate represents to the world that God can do what government can't do, God can do what the world can't do. But if there was some family that had their way, they'd say, you don't go, don't go to City Gate Church because our, fam our family doesn't fit in at City Gate Church. They're trying to put you in a box. What are you spending your money on? Did you ask my permission if you could spend your money on that? Why are you wasting your money on that? You don't need that. I remember, I'm going to tell them my dad. My dad tried to put me in a box one time because I wanted to buy a pickup truck. I wanted this pickup truck, this white pickup truck, and I was determined I was going to buy. And my dad told me every day of my life, you're going to hate you bought a pickup truck. You're never going to use that pickup truck. You're going to, you're going to be so, you're going to regret that you ever bought that pickup truck. I bought the pickup truck. Guess who was the first person to ask me if they could use my pickup truck? <laughs> my dad. How about this wall? This is another wall the enemy brings in our life to box us in. It's the wall of friends. Friends. Friends try to determine your moral standards. Friends try to tell you what's right and what's wrong. Friends will tell you what you should be upset at and what you shouldn't be upset at. Friends. And the whole friends thing went to another level when we all got introduced to social media. Because now because of social media, we're all pressured into thinking a certain way or you ain't going to have any friends. Because right now you have how many friends? You have 2,749 friends. Ain't one of them your friend. None of them. That's a click. It's a digital click. It's not a friend friend and you are determining your values you're determining how you live your life you're letting people who don't even know you determine your happiness and determine what you can be satisfied about well my life doesn't measure up their life doesn't measure up to what they're posting online and you're trying to get your life to measure up to something that's not even real because you say it's a friend friend trying to build this box. See, the walls are starting to close in now. It's starting to feel a little claustrophobic. Something's trying to put me in a box. This is, this is things the enemy's bringing into my life. And so the final thing, the final wall he wants to put in my box is fear. Fear. Or for all the Christian folks out there, concern. I ain't afraid. I ain't worried. I'm just concerned. It's fear. Fear. Fear that you think you can't live without. Fear that you're trying to hide behind calling it wisdom. Fear you're trying to say, oh, no, 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 this is the right thing. Because, you know, I, I read this and I read this and I watched this online and I, I saw this on the news and I saw they were fear. 
fear, fear, fear. See, I'm not talking about something that's just showed up in your life in the last month or in the last two months because of a pandemic. No, I'm talking about walls that the enemy has slowly been building in your life since you were a child. Let me tell you something about the devil. He is in no hurry. He is patient. He will take his time putting these walls in your life till one day you turn and try to get out and run headfirst into a wall. And the final thing he wants to use to box you in is fear. Fear. To walk around being afraid. To walk around feeling hopeless. There are some of you watching today that if nothing's going wrong, you're afraid of that. My life shouldn't be going this good. Something's bound to happen. Expecting something bad. That's what fear does. Fear causes you to live your life on the worst case scenario. Worst WCS. Worst case scenario. What's the worst that could happen? Let me tell you how much fear used to control me. I used to be terrified to fly. And do you know what? I would get on a plane and try to run through my, my mind, and I would try to use this to make me feel okay. I would get on the plane and think, what's the worst that could happen? That's messed up, isn't it? Messed up. What's the worst that could happen? Well, the top could come off. Well, the wings could snap. How long is it going to take before we hit the ground? Let's count this out. What am I going to think? Am I, what is my last moments? Am I going to have time to call Kim because she didn't want to go with me? And she put me on here. She knew what was going to happen. And now she put me on here by myself. So am I going to have time to call her? What, this worst case, what's the worst that could happen? You say, Pastor, that's ridiculous. Nobody wants to get on a plane thinking about the worst that can happen. But yet every day you wake up recently, you wake up thinking, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst they've said on the news? What's the worst they've said on a press conference? If I send my kids to school, what's the worst that could happen? If I go to the grocery store, what's the worst that could happen? Well, if the economy goes down even further, what's the worst that could happen? What if I don't get my job back? What's the worst that could happen? And you've been living your life, WCS, worst case scenario, but what God wants to speak to you today is BCS, best case scenario. You ought to wake up every day of your life saying, what's the best that could happen today? What is the best? In the midst of a recession, in the midst of a depression, what if I got a raise today? What if I get a promotion today? What if my kids go to school and they advance in school? What if? What if? Instead of dwelling on the worst, start thinking about the best because I'll tell you something about fear. Fear is not your friend. Fear is a liar. I heard about, uh, we, have this, we have this camera on the back of our house. And if anything, mo anything moves in the backyard, the camera turns on, spotlights turn on, and we can see it. So the other day I got this alert, something's in your backyard. It was about 10 o'clock at night. Something's in your backyard. Worst case scenario. That's what I went to. All right, who am I going to have to put down? Somebody's trying, to, somebody's trying to get me. Somebody's trying to get Kim. What am I going to have to do? It was a coyote. Coyote running right up across our deck, right up, I mean, right around the swing set. Coyote. And you know what I read about coyotes? They like to eat people's dogs. Those little toy dogs. You know, I ain't going to have one of the little toy dogs. If I get a dog, it's going to be a dog. I mean, it's going to be... But this, these coyotes, and they said they eat these little toy dogs, but here's how they do it. They eat the dogs by playing with them. They will play with the little dog till the little dog starts to trust them. Till the little dog starts thinking the coyote's my friend. And when they think the coyote's their friend, the coyote turns and snaps and kills that little dog. My question to you today is, have you been playing around with fear? Because fear's got you thinking, it's okay. You can live with a little bit of fear. It's not too much. You can handle this level of fear. But at the worst moment of your life, fear's going to turn, and he's going to snap, and you're going to be stuck in a box with no way out. And you're going to say, how did I ever get here? How did I ever get in this box? I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. I want to go forward, but I can't. I want to go to the left. I can't. The right, I can't. I can't even go backwards. I feel like I'm stuck in this box. How did I ever get here? played around with fear one day too long. I heard a story 
It's a true story. There was a man that was called out. He was a repairman. And he was called out to fix a refrigeration car on this train. The refrigeration car had broken down. True story. The man got in there. He started working on the refrigeration unit. And the door, nobody was there. He was working overtime. The door to this box, this cart on this train slid closed and locked. And he was trapped inside this refrigeration, this freezer car of this train. He started to panic. He could feel the cold setting in. He could feel himself starting to freeze. It was hard to breathe. The next morning, somebody got there, knew the man had been working overnight, and they couldn't find him anywhere. Somebody said, go check the car. They opened the door, and this is a true story. The the medical report for this man, he died. The medical report was he froze to death. Wow. Here's the interesting thing. He was there to fix the broken freezer unit. The freezer didn't work. But his mind was so powerful that he froze to death in a broken freezer cart. And what I want to show you today is that the enemy has trapped you into something that's not real. And you're living bound by it. And you're living subdued by it. And you're living feeling like I can't get out. You're waking up in the morning feeling like I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. And it's not real. The enemy's plans are. The enemy's plan was broken on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Get the final piece. Because guess who's been behind this the whole time? Turn it around, Blake. Satan's been behind this the whole time. See, I don't fight against family. I don't fight against friends because there's something behind them. Behind every person, there's a spirit that's driving that person. The apostle Paul said, I don't fight against flesh and blood, but against every spirit and principality in heavenly places. In other words, it wasn't my family. It wasn't my friends. There was a devil behind it. It wasn't religion. It wasn't reli- It was a devil behind religion. And guess who is the author of fear? God is not the author of fear. God is not the author of confusion. But de- the devil is the author of fear and chaos and confusion and he brought all these walls into your life because he wanted to get you in a box come back behind here and you know why he wanted to get you boxed in because he wanted to put a lid on your dreams oh come on he wanted to put a lid on your purpose he wanted to put a lid on your family Because guess what happens when I put a lid on a box? It becomes a coffin. And that's what he wanted to happen. He wanted to kill your dreams. He wanted to kill your vision. He wanted to kill every desire God put in your heart. He wanted to kill every dream God put in your heart. He wanted to kill every dream God put in your heart. And let me say, because somebody in this room is watching me right now, and you are right here. This pandemic was just the final wall to your box. It's a box the enemy's building, been building for a long time, and this is just the final wall. And can I tell you, you're right here. You're right here. And there comes a point in your life where you have to decide, I'm either going to lay down and die or I'm going to stand up and fight. I'm either going to lay down and call it quits or I'm going to stand up and say no. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. God did not bring me this far just to let me die inside of this box. And what I've come to tell somebody today is it may not have been there last week, but this week you can see a crack. You can see some light coming through the box. What's happening? You said enough's enough. I'm not going to let the enemy put the lid on my dreams. I'm not going to let friends stop me. I'm not going to let family stop me. I'm not going to let fear stop me. I'm not going to let religion stop me. I'm coming out of this box, and I'm going to move forward. Because I got a promise of abundant life. Take about three seconds. It's a gift.
my daughter Sage. Come here, Sage. You've seen her sitting up here the past couple weeks. It's been fun having her up here. But parents, let me say something to you. If you don't get out of this box, you'll drag your kids inside of this box. You'll bring your children inside of this box. And they'll have to fight the same devils you had to fight. And they'll have to fight the same addictions you had to fight. And they'll have to fight the same habits you had to fight. But guess what? Here's what I want to encourage somebody today. If I get out of this box, if I break free from fear, if I break free from people, if I break free from the plan of the enemy, not only am I coming out, my family is coming out with me. You got dreams on the inside of you. And I didn't come this far to quit today. Grit, don't quit. Jesus, you change everything. Jesus, you change everything. Jesus, you change everything. Does anybody know he changes everything? Is that, is that ministering to somebody online? Tell me right now. If that's speaking to you, tell me. Tell me right there in your comments. Tell me. God's speaking to you. You're coming out of that box today. And you know what I love about it? It's Mother's Day. So you're going to always be able to measure the moment you got out. You're going to look back and say, on Mother's Day 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of the worst spirit of fear that's ever swept the world, I got free. I got out. And my family got out. This week I've been reading from this writer. He lived back in the 1800s. His name was Phillips Brooks. Now you probably don't know that name, but you know a song he wrote. We sing it at Christmas time called Old Little Town of Bethlehem. This man was a prolific preacher and writer. And he wrote something. I've got some quotes I'm going to share with you next week too. But I want you to hear this quote. Because here's how I want to end this today. Listen to this. Someday in years to come, you will be wrestling with the great temptation or trembling under the great sorrow of your life. But the real struggle is here. Now. Now it is being decided whether in the day of your supreme sorrow or temptation, you shall miserably fail or gloriously conquer. Now. Somebody shout now. No, no, I'm going to work on it tomorrow. Now. See, I'm doing something right now that's going to determine a year from now whether I fail or whether I conquer. I'm doing something now. Here. Now. Here. Now. See, Jesus. Jesus, you take that. Right here and right now.